record this. Everybody, uh, welcome to Five Features. Um, today we're joined with a really special guest, a legendary Big Five guy. Uh, first team all Big Five, two-time all A-10 player. Now he's a professional overseas player, um, Tyreek Duran. Tyreek, how are you doing today, man? Thanks for joining us. Good, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I saw you were at the uh, LaSalle game this weekend. Uh, what was that sort of reception like? And, uh, you know, what was what was it like coming coming back to LaSalle and seeing them get a big win this weekend? Um, it was good, man. It was good to uh, just get there. My bad. Let me close the door real quick. Right. It was good to get there and see everybody. Um, that's actually like my first time being able to actually watch a LaSalle game in a long time, you know, from traveling overseas and everything. So just to be able to uh, to come back home and, and, you know, one of my first games is – them honoring us for a Sweet 16 trip. And they also actually got to win that game, too. So uh, it was a great feeling, man. Good feeling to be back there. I mean, I always come up there when I'm home, but it's yeah. usually not during the season. So that was it was a good feeling just to see everything, you know, during the season again. Yeah, I'd imagine you can't get the uh, the A-10 sh- sh- games on and went overseas where you're at. But, you know, good to check in. I'm sure you've been checking in on the team uh, in the last couple of years. Yeah, trying, man, trying. But like you said, it's, it's hard, especially with the time difference and everything you overseas. Yeah, definitely. So, so sort of going back to, uh, you know, your beginnings in of basketball and in, in the city. You know, I spoke with Shays Austin last week from Temple, um, and he sort of talked about the toughness of the city and sort of how that melt, like molds, you know, great players. And there's almost this, this atmosphere that, you know, I want to be better than the next guy in the city because they know that the top guys in the city are going to make it to a really high level. And I'm wondering your perspective on that and if you share that same sentiment. Um, I think just playing in the city alone, I think that uh, that just makes you play harder just because, like like you just touched on, um, everybody you play against every night is going to be a matchup. Don't matter if that person going D1, D2, D3. Like, if you playing somebody in Philly, just even if it's like a neighborhood thing, like, oh, he's from, from such and such, or, you know, like a school thing, like he go to such and such, there are rivals. Like, everybody, everybody going to give you their best every night. So I think that that alone is like – Breeds the toughness, and I think that's why when you talk to a lot of college coaches, they say they love for the guard just because of the, the toughness that everybody brings. And I, I pretty, much, I think you get that with every Philly player that you get, whether it's a guard, a big man, or what. I think you gonna oh. get that toughness because I think the the city just breeds that. Like you know what I mean? It's just like I said, no, you're not gonna get an easy game in Philly. Yeah. Or an easy, a easy come up, I should say. Like you're gonna have to earn everything. You're gonna have to earn your spot, earn your ranking, whatever it is. Definitely, man. And when you were sort of growing up, did you did you you know keep tracks on the on the Big Five? Were you a guy who were, was a big fan of like those guys from your neighborhood or from around the area that you know went to a LaSalle, went to a Temple? Um, yeah, I mean, I kept up with the Big Five. You know, I mean, it's hard it's hard to not to keep up with it when you play basketball in the city, um, yeah. just because it's like your parents, your friends, everybody's going to talk about it. Temple, whether it's Temple, Nova, you know, LaSalle, St. Joe's. I was I actually grew up a big St. Joe's fan. So um, I played on the team AU team with Jermaine Austin's little brother. Oh, there so you go. That, yeah, yeah. So that, right he, there. I, yeah, so when we uh <laughs> when they went to the when they went when they had that run, um I actually remember we all met up, like the old AU team met up and watched we were watching most of their games uh during that time. So I always was a big St. Joe's fan. Like my, my dream school was always St. Joe's, like just from seeing that. So uh wow. yeah, I always I always followed the big five. Like no I, I would say Nova and, and St. Joe's are always my favorites. Yeah. Yeah, those are some of the premier programs I feel like going back in the, in the history. And, you know, talk about Goretti, um, such a powerhouse school in the Philly Catholic League, known nationally as being a great basketball program. And not only is that a great program, but your team specifically and under your sort of leadership on that was some of the best teams they've ever really had there. I think you guys had what, like a 30 and one season, Philly League champs, Catholic League champs, state champs. Talk about the sort of that team and what that program still means to you. And also, like, maybe what was the, what was sort of the, the the best part of that? What is if as a Philly guy, is, is the Catholic League the best part of that or is uh I don't even that's that's a tough question because I mean of course the Catholic League was the was a great part of it, you know, just because once again the competition you're playing yeah. every night you playing somebody that's you know that's ranked or that's like a high a high up name in Philly. Yeah. So um just playing that Garetti alone, we always had a target on our back. And I mean, even to this day I argue with Scoop. Earl and all them about who had the best Newman Garetti team. That's another fun <laughs> aspect of it. Like, there's so many different good players that come through there that you just get to keep talking to different uh, different eras and, you know, get their, their outlook on it. Like, how was your time? Or 
or whatever the case may be. Because, I mean, you talk to anybody, they're going to say, oh, well, we played against such and such. Like, anybody you talk to that went to Newman, they're going to tell you, like, oh, well, we played we played against NBA players, too. We played against such and such. And, like, yeah. the list just goes on and on. But, like, we always in the argument. Like, well, listen, we were number two in the country. One shot away from being number one in the country. Like, nobody can really say that yeah. other than, like, our, other than our class. So, uh, yeah, my time at New, I always tell people to this day, that was the, for me, as far as basketball, but that was the funnest time. The most fun I had uh, in basketball in my life. Like every trip we went on, it was like it was like literally like a brotherhood. We all got along. It was really no issues. Um, of course, you had problems. But I mean, it's nothing like serious. Just like on court issues. Like everybody, you know, because everybody want to win. Like that, yeah. that was my main thing. We knew everybody wanted to win. We basically did whatever we had to do to win. We held guys accountable. You know, nobody was getting mad that somebody was getting recruited high. You know what I mean? Like, some yeah. of the problems that the teams might run into, we didn't really have that on that team. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was an unbelievable team. And when you guys were when you guys were in high school, I mean, you specifically were getting uh, a great deal of accolades in terms of, you know, I think you got the uh, Philly Daily News, first team all player, player of the year, all this kind of uh, uh, hype and accolades, I guess. Did, did that sort of signify to you when you see yourself in those newspapers and stuff that, uh, you know, you're a top guy or did you already have that feeling? On to be honest, it, it kind of happened overnight. Like, I don't know if it was AAU or what it was, but it's just yeah. like, I think it, it actually might have came from that summer playing with team final. And then it's just like, I just noticed I started getting like a lot more calls from like college coaches, started getting more and more recruitment letters. Yeah. The next thing, like your phone's just ringing off the hook. Like your coach is calling you, hey, such and such wants to come down and watch you practice. It's like, damn, like, are you, are you, we went back to a year ago. It's like, it wasn't no coaches in the gym for <laughs> And then it's like, now, Coming to the gym is like 10, 20 coaches in there, like for you. And it's like, oh snap, like, all right, well, like this is some something's starting to happen now. So so I said, I mean, just thinking back on it, it it make me like give me like butterflies because it was like it's a crazy time, man. Like I said, it just kind of all happened overnight. And you're a guy who's playing at pretty much every level. I mean, what is that like when you hear like, you know, I'm coming to see you tonight and it's a big opportunity? Do you get that extra like you know, butterfly in your stomach, like you said? Do you, does the nerves kick in or you know? Um, I mean, to me, the nerves, they don't really kick in. Because it's like, once you're on that floor, you don't really got time to think about none of that. Like, yeah. once you're on that floor, it's your five. It's our five against that five. Like, you're not really thinking about nobody in the crowd. You All you think about is, all right, we got to win this one. We got to win this one. Because our whole thing was we were, we were like, I know at least my senior year, like, we were ranked high. So our whole thing was like, yo, we can't lose. Like, no matter who we playing against, we, we in the city, we can't lose. We in a different state, we can't lose because we know mm-hmm. If we lose to somebody that's ranked behind us, like we're gonna lose our rank, especially after we once we got that number two rank, because I think that year we came in, I don't even think we were ranked top ten. So like just from that, we um I know our whole thing was like after we left Hawaii, we had, we lost to Yates, which was the number one team. So after that, our whole thing, like that's when that 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 bug kicked in. It was like, all right, we gotta keep this on. Like we were we were slept on, everybody think we sweet. Mm. We we played like I think like three top ten teams while we were in Hawaii alone. And we beat all of them except Yates, which was the number one team. I don't know if you remember the Yates. They were putting up like 120, 30 points a game. They were beating teams by like 100. Yeah. So it, was a, it, was a crazy, it was a crazy team, man. We, we, they said to this day, like, we were the only team that really played them like that close. And we only lost to them by one. Yeah, that man. same tournament, Newman actually just won that tournament like two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After we lost in the championship when I was there, so. Yeah, and I talked to some people. Uh, said I was going to be interviewing you, and you know, they all they had to say was, you know, you're a, you're a Catholic League legend. So, how's it feel? <laughs> how's it feel to sort of have that sort of regard in the city as one of the guys who really made an impact? Um, it's it's always good to hear that, man. Just because, like you said, you, like, I'm sure you can run down a list of people from the city that you know that are like legit players, and like just to have my name mentioned with them, it's like okay, like you know, I, the work I put in. The work I put in actually paid off. You know, it wasn't done for no reason. So, yeah. Any anytime people talk about like the greats in Philly or the greats of the Big Five, and they like they mention my name or they bring up a statistic, it's like, oh yeah, you're top five and that, or you're up there with that. It's like, like I said, it's another thing that's give me butterflies. Like, damn, like I came a long way with that. Yeah, yeah. So, sort of your senior year. When did you commit to LaSalle? Was it your senior year? Or your... Yeah, we all. Me, Stop, Danny Stewart, and uh, Tony Chanel, we all committed. We all, well, we know we made our announcement around the same time. I'm not sure we all committed at the same time. We all, I know we all, I think we all signed our letter of intent that November. But like, you know, you can verbally commit or whatever. So I think yeah. I had verbally committed like, 
probably I want to say before, like right before school had started for my senior year, because I, I kind of I wanted to wait, but the guy that was in my crew, he's like, man, this is not fair to coaches for you to wait out, you know, <laughs> blah blah blah. So I like, listen, I, I know I want to stay home, so I'm gonna go ahead and commit. Cause I actually at first I, I gave a, a verbal to Temple. I was gonna I had committed to Temple, but I told them I was like, listen, man, I, I committed them way back in the, like the beginning of the summer. I, I was going yeah. up there every day playing pick up with them, like Scooty, Ramon, and all of them, Khalif. And I can admit, I was like, man, I fell in love with it. Um, then I think the whole situation with LaSalle had had, I forget how it happened. I think Karan Burton had got locked up and they didn't have no point guards. So, you know, G started recruiting me. He's like, yeah, you know, you come here, you're starting right away. Whereas Temple, I was going to have to wait. Um, yeah. Play behind Juan Fernandez or whatever. So I was like, listen, it's a no-brainer for me. I want to play right away. I don't want to sit on the bench. <laughs> yeah. And is that, is that sort of like a selling factor that a lot of coaches came to you with? Like, you know, we want you to get you in right away. And, you know, not to say that people are dishonest, but I think sometimes people have those conversations and they sometimes, you know, it didn't work out that way. But that seems like LaSalle, it, it actually helps. Yeah, it, it, they weren't lying, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think LaSalle, LaSalle actually might have been the only, G might have been the only one that told me straight up, like, listen, you're going to come here and start right away. Because uh, that's the one that I, I give for the friend Dunphy. Like, I I had a lot of respect for him because he, he was honest with me. He's like, listen, yeah. you're not going to start. I can't start you. I got a senior guard, which is good. Yeah. He's like, I'd be crazy to start you uh, over him. Um, so, G, he just, he was honest. He's like, listen, he came straight before he flew out to Sacramento to go. The guy I was dealing with, that was in my recruiting at the time, was dealing with Tyreek Evans. He's like his uh, trainer, Lamont Peterson. Okay. So he flew out to – he called me one day. He's like, listen, this guy, Coach Giannini, I don't, I never met him. I don't know who he is. He's, like, he's about to fly all the way out to Sacramento just to have lunch with me. <laughs> he flew all the way out there to uh, to go talk to him or whatever. And after that, it was kind of solidified. I actually, I wanted to go to Miami. Miami told me they were waiting for Brandon Knight. And I'm like, we all knew Brandon Knight wasn't going, wasn't committing to Kentucky, uh, was going to Kentucky at the time. So I was like, I'm not <laughs> waiting for y'all. So I, I scratched them off the list and, like I said, at that point, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stay home. I didn't really care about any of the other schools. Yeah, you mentioned Giannini, and, uh, you know, obviously it with known mostly for that great run in 16, or, uh, 12 and 13, but is he a guy that maybe doesn't get enough shine in the Big Five as far as like a, good, a great coach and a great, you know, impact on, on that program? Or, you know, do you think he's sometimes doesn't get a name necessarily with the top coaches of the era? Um, I mean, it's hard because I think when you look at the Big Five, Legends. I feel like, yeah, no, nah, it's like I, I feel like he just had like a he got dealt with a bad hand because he had some good rosters. Like even when I first got there, we had Eric Murray, we were supposed to be good, and that kind of ended up being like a disaster. Yeah. So I think he like he could have put the if he could have put together like a couple more seasons like the ones we had, I think he would definitely be mentioned with like the greats in the big five. Or like say he made it to the tournament one more time, they made a run. I feel, I feel yeah. like he'd be mentioned with like this. The Fran Dunphy's or you know Jay Wright's or even the Phil Martelli's, like however you want to look at it, however you look at like the top coaches of the Big Five. But from my experience, he definitely deserves to be mentioned with him. Yeah, he's a hell of a recruiter too. Like he's he's a great guy when it comes to recruiting. Yeah, it seems like you guys all have a good relationship with him. I think I saw mm-hmm. some video you guys watching the recapping the uh, the twenty twelve run. Would you um you know would you give advice to young guys in the city that? these big five schools are worthwhile and staying around is, you know, the connections you make, the the great play and playing in front of your family and friends in these great schools. Would you, would you give that as a recommendation to a young guy in the city who's trying to come up or would you say go somewhere else if they, if they have the opportunity? It's crazy you asked me that because I literally just had that conversation with one of my uh, best friends like two days ago. He was, because he asked me, he's like, hey, why are you, he's like, I don't understand why, um, why big five schools don't recruit in Philly. It's like, you know, big five, a lot of schools, I mean, a lot of the big five schools get recruits from, like, D.C., Jersey, or New York. And it's yeah. like, like, y'all got a hot bed right here. Why don't y'all just recruit <laughs> here? And I told him, I like, it's hard to, to me, it's hard to recruit in this, like, it's hard to recruit kids from the city to stay in the city. Because, like, it's not like we have a bunch of schools that are, like, off campus, like, you know, in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Like, these schools are actually in Philly. And yeah. Like, you know how it is in Philly right now. Like, it's not the best place to live. And, like, these schools are literally in the hood, like the South Temple, they're in the hood. So, like, when it comes to – I feel like when it comes to recruiting kids from Philly, it's like, how do you how do you market your school to them? You know what I mean? Like, unless you're, like, a Nova and St. Joe's is kind of, like, yeah. on the cusp of in the suburbs of it in the city. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I feel like when it comes to, like, LaSalle Temple or even, like, you no, know, Drexel has their own. Like, they're, they're – 
good academic program, Jackson and Penn. But it's like, I feel like LaSalle and Temple is just difficult to, to market it to a kid that's from the inner city to convince them to stay home in the city besides the fact that, oh, well, you get to stay with your family. Like me, that was my whole design factor. Like I wanted to stay home with my family. I was like, I want my family been following my whole career since Newman, since I was young. I said, I want my family to be at every home game that I had. And that's a, literally how it was. And that's what allowed me to drag uh, drag Jarrell there and recruit Tyrone. Like only one I didn't really recruit from there was Ramon because I didn't know Ramon before he, uh, he came there. But yeah, everybody else, I told him straight up, like, listen, like the same way it was in high school, like that's how our, that's how our college game is going to be. All your family going to be right here sitting behind the bench. <laughs> you can talk to him. You can – you can see in front of the, like, you know what I mean? Like, that was my selling factor with everything. I'm like, you're going to be home. So, but, like, for any other kid, I feel like if a coach is coming to recruit them, it's like, what's what's going to be a selling point? Like, you can tell them, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to play. Blah, blah, blah. But they're going to be like, oh, you know, a lot of people, they, a lot of people, um, their support circles are telling them to get away from Philly, to yeah. get away from the environment. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. It's kind of like, how do you balance that? Or how do you try to tell a kid, hey, yeah, you're going to be home, but you're not going to be home because you're going to be on campus. It's like, I'm on I'm on campus at Temple. That's like, all right, I'm still walking around the hood. I'm at the time, <laughs> I'm still walking around. Like, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, you're in the hood. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, the, so to me, it's tough. Like I, I, like I said, I literally just had that conversation two days ago, man. Yeah. And, like, that's, to me, that's just my outlook on it. Like, I understand what he was saying, but at the same time, it's just like, look at it from – from a kid growing up in Philly, look at it from his standpoint. Like he don't want to see that again. <laughs> yeah, and if, <laughs> if he's he got enough, the option I mean... to go to like, yeah, like if he has the option to go, say like, you got the option to go to like a Notre Dame or like a or like a, a Power Five school. Why would you stay home? And you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's like you get to live out your dream. So it's like I don't, I don't blame kids for when they they go away to a big school because of the name or because of whatever. And then they end up transferring back. It's like, all right, well, at least you got to get that experience. And if you don't like it, then transfer. Especially now, the transfer rules are are easy. It's like you can go wherever you want. You can get three more years if you want. You know what I mean? It's, it's nuts. It's crazy. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. I, um, you know, what do you, what are your thoughts on this whole transfer thing? Because I know it's you know it's everyone's talking about that in the NIL. Um, you know, from just the perspective of an out an outsider at this point, like it, it's it's almost thousands of kids transferring every year. I mean, what do you think what do you think that says about the mentality of kind of the league and the way it's headed? Sorry, I should have grabbed this charger. Um, as far as the NI, I mean, as far as the transfer thing, I, I don't really, I don't support it 100% because I feel like it just, it gives kids an easy way out. And um, I feel like it just doesn't let you, it doesn't let the kids stick around and figure it out. Yep. Like, I feel like sometimes like a kid would go over there and it's like, oh, he told me I was going to play but I'm like the sixth, seventh man. I'm not playing as much as I want. So let me just transfer as I can. It's like, nah, like you never know. Like next year after them seniors graduate, you can come right in and, and be the man. Yeah. Like, so why would you why would you want to transfer? Like I said, I, I think it just gives kids the the easy way out. I don't really think it like grooms them into becoming mature. I think it's just a it's just a gateway for them to say, Oh, well, you know, I, my coach wasn't treating me right when the whole time the coach was doing his job, you just weren't ready. Yeah. And uh, as far as the NIL, I think that I don't know. I'm I'm fifty fifty with the NIL as well because I feel like that's kind of I feel like it's making kids not work as hard anymore. You know what I mean? Like they're you're not really working for anything. Like you're paid. You're in college. You can go to school. You can you you don't have to go to class. Whatever you can do whatever you want. You have the NIL deal, which really doesn't have nothing to do with the school. It's if that's if I'm correct. I think that's what I read about it. it doesn't really, yeah. I think it's yeah. it's like separate. So it's like what is it like? How are you gonna motivate your kid? Are like you sitting there yelling at your kid at the kid to come do better when this kid got a three hundred thousand dollars deal? <laughs> <laughs> so I, know I was talking to one of my friends from he coaches at Miami. Um, and he was just saying, oh, they had like some type of dilemma with one oh, kid yeah. getting like a. Is he probably, he probably heard, yeah, yeah. yeah, he probably heard of the story. He he said they had like some type of dilemma with that. And I'm like, that's what it's gonna cause when you when you bring in money to a situation and everybody's not getting the same amount of money. You gonna cause a dilemma because it's gonna be jealousy. Like somebody, because yeah. Isaiah Wong was already there. He's he's looking at it like, all right, well, I should get this. I'm the star. Like you know what I mean. Yeah. Then the new guy comes in. Yeah, it's crazy. So man. my whole my, yeah, my whole thing with with playing with paying the college athletes, I think they should have just gave them a set amount. Like all right, because you know college athletes, they're not gonna argue about how much they're making. Like you could have yeah. gave you could have gave kids five grand a year, and they would have been like, all right, perfect. That's cool. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't. 
back when I was in college, I was I wouldn't have been mad about five grand or even uh, like four, like you know what I mean? Just something. Oh, we yeah, just yeah. wanted something. Yeah. So spending it was money. crazy. Man. Yeah, yeah. Like I know I talked to Ty all the time. He's like, man, if we would have had the NIL, NIL deal and we hit the sweet 16s, like we all be good right now. So, oh yeah. yeah but we came in the wrong era, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Talk about uh I'm a St. Joe's fan, so you know I watch a lot of eight ten basketball. I watch a lot I of. Say that the Jameer Nelson uh, Sports Illustrated. Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah, Christmas yeah. gift for, for, for the man. My, my, my dad got a sign. One. <laughs> oh yeah, oh damn. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know you got a relationship with Jameer, so I was gonna get into that later. But um, you know, talk about the thing people say about the eight ten is you know it's one of the premier mid major te- mid majors, uh, if not the like one of the highest levels of mid major team, uh, a program. And the thing that we say about it is the big ten, in the A ten is the, the guard play specifically, and, you know. It is and a, a, you know guard plays great. Also, I say a lot of times like undersized guards that have tremendous skill sets that you know maybe should have went into a higher area, but um, you know had that skill set but didn't have the height that looks on paper like they yeah, should. Yeah. I, talk about sort of they that. Did the odds, <laughs> yeah. What do you think about that? And like you know some of the, some great battles you had in the A ten is. Do you, do you think that's true? Sort of that that. Uh, Oh yeah, that's, 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 enough, that's funny. Funny you bring that up. I that, I just had that conversation the other day uh, with somebody, <laughs> and I was talking about how that eight ten has like some of the toughest guards that I've ever played against. Cause especially my man, my freshman year, every team that we played against had like a top premier guard. I mean, you go to Dayton, we go to George Washington. They had Tony Teller there. Uh, I can't ever remember the guy from Richmond. He was good. They had a short, a short guard at Richmond. I can't ever remember his name. But it's like yeah. every school in the eight ten that we that I played against had like a, a a top guard. Two Holloway at Xavier. Then they had um, what was the other guy that, that transferred to Arizona? I can't think of his name right now. Oh my god, uh, it's gonna come to me later. But like, <laughs> like I said, every every school we played, St. Joe's. You think about uh. The guy that they had, my yeah, I can't remember his name either. But like every school, every school we played, like it's just so many names popping in my head right now. Like I'm, I'm literally drawing blanks. But yeah. every school, they all have them. had yeah, like every school had a guard, like a point guard that was like, all right, you gotta like you gotta bring your A game today, or else you're gonna be forgotten in the A ten if you do that. So like as a freshman, it was like it was kind of shell shock because I wasn't expecting, like you said, it's a mid major conference. You know, you don't really expect it to be that crazy. I'm like, all right, you know, I could have went anywhere. Like I was. I was like a top guy. I'm thinking I'm 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 over this. I only went here as a like um like a cop out or whatever. But yeah. you start playing and you you looking around, you're like, man, this guy averaged 20, this guy averaged 18. It's like the hell I'm a, I'm a freshman. I'm like, what about what I'm about to do with this? So <laughs> then on top of that, you got the big five games, you coming around, you got play Villanova and uh, it was crazy, man. Like just even to just add like uh three of the big five, three big five schools are in the um in the eight ten alone. So is I don't know for me. I always think that, like when it came to guards, the A ten is like top tier. When it came to that, like other conferences might get like the the strong big men or whatever yeah. you make like the NBA big men, but I'm like the A ten for guards, they uh they had it. Yeah, for sure. Do you think uh you know LaSalle has like sort of an underdog identity in the eight, in the Big Five and in the A ten as well with like sort of the Big Five scene, you know. Especially in the last couple of decades, two decades or so. Hold on one second. Mine, the jacket. It, mine, the jacket. Um, as far as being an underdog, I, I think so. But like I said, if you – I just think that the history wasn't as good recently. You know what I mean? Like, but, like even before we won, like what was like what was the last time the side might have been like kind of relevant? Yeah. Then you look at it like, all right, after we left, like the sound kind of kind of went down. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't, I don't really call them an underdog. I just think you gotta kind of accept, <laughs> accept your fate of what you've done in the past. Like, what have you done for the league? Yeah, in recent years, and I think they just, they just haven't been consistent enough to be considered like one of them top tier teams. And that's another thing that make that makes recruiting hard. It's like if you're not winning, and you're like not a hot spot for for recruits, it's like how are you gonna lure recruits in there? Yeah. So, like, like I said, at our time, I think we just happened to have all the pieces click at the right time. Like we were winning. We had two people from Philly there. So I think it kind of made recruiting a lot easier for G. But it's like when you when we all left, he had players, but it's like they they didn't win. Then they like they just were inconsistent. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, so I, I don't think I would ever call them call this out like underdogs or underrated. It's just 
Like I said, you just gotta live with the results you put out. Yeah, it's hard to build that sustained success, especially like you see like Villanova. I mean, how the chances of that happening are pretty rare. You know, I mean, that's a great program, yeah. and great coach, and everything, great recruiting. Like you said, in the in the rich suburbs, but uh, you know, the the, the chances of that happening are, are are pretty slim. But so speaking of that sort of the 2012 season, um, how does it feel sort of to be like written in sort of the record books of LaSalle? Like you just said, they never really made it there since or before. Um, and as a perspective of you, you probably have a different different perspective for me because I'm watching it as, you know, every time there's a March Madness game, there's always that sort of Cinderella team and everyone's really hyped about them. Mm-hmm. And everyone's, uh, we're rooting for, the, it's sort of like not just Philly fans rooting for, you know, the whole country's rooting for LaSalle to beat these top teams. What was that like on your side of it to be sort of like in the spotlight in that sense? And what was that experience like? It was surreal, man. I um stuff through all the time. Like after that Kansas State game, we got a video of us and I'm in the locker room and everybody's celebrating. I'm just sitting on the I'm sitting on a chair just like with my hand on my head drinking Powerade. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, why like why wasn't you celebrating? Like you you the only one looking out. I'm like, yo, I couldn't breathe. I'm like that, like that is the craziest game yeah. that I ever played in my life. I'm like it was a, I'm like the it was a sold out crowd. We played we played K State in Kansas, so it was all okay. K State people. I think we had like 20 people maybe there. It was like a little patch in the crowd of the South, and and it just was like a nonstop game. It's like every every play of that game mattered. Like we started off like I think we started off on a crazy run, and then they came back. Yeah. But then you know, after that, yeah, yeah. But then after that, they they narrowed the lead down. It's like you know how it is. You on the road, you playing in their home, so it's like all right, bro, this is getting crazy. So, um, but that that whole run in general was just insane. It's like every city we went to, like you said, people were rooting for us just because we were the underdog. And uh, we kind of got overshadowed by Florida Golf Coast. That was the only thing that pissed me yeah. off about it. You know, if I don't remember Florida Golf Coast had that. Yeah, Lob City, right? With, yeah, yeah, yeah. They like the, the Lob City of college. It was like, man, like every time we knock somebody off, <laughs> we get like a we get like a five second clip on ESPN. And then you got Florida Golf Coast coming in with like two minutes worth of dunks. And, it was crazy, but he, like just from Philly alone, we were getting so much love. Like they were sending us videos from people celebrating on campus. All our social medias was going off crazy. And social media wasn't even as big as it is like right now. The Facebook, like yeah, fa- the thing was like Facebook, Twitter was out, Instagram was out, but it just wasn't as big as it is now. But we were still getting like so much love. Like uh, on Twitter, it was crazy. Like every two seconds, we were getting retweeted or, or mentioned or something. So it was like that. That. That one week of one and a half weeks of fame was crazy. Yeah, that's probably a surreal experience. Like you just sort of mentioned. What do you think your what would you describe like your role in those LaSalle teams were? Like, because the way I've said it is probably sort of like you, you said you kind of set the tempo, I'd say you control the offense a little bit and you were sort of a game game manager, but you also obviously got your buckets as well. But what, what would you sort of describe your role in that on that team was? Uh, to me, like you said, was just pretty much a game manager, just to be an actual point guard. Cause, um, like Coach Horace Owens, that was our assistant coach, he always called me and Ramon like fire and ice. Was like I was like the quiet, laid back guy. Ramon was the energetic guy. He get the dunks. He go crazy, yell at everybody. You know what I mean? And I was like that kind of uh, just mellow. I'm always the same throughout the game. So my job for that team was literally just keep everybody together, keep the Keep everybody in sync. Don't let us get out of hand. You know, when they team other team goes on a run, like just make the right play. Get everybody involved. Make sure everybody's, you know, doing their job. And I think just playing with Ramon that just made it a lot easier because so, like we both had we both could trust each other. Like I knew what he was going to do every game. He knew what I was going to do every game. Yeah. Like, if one was having a bad game, the other one picked up where he lacked. So it was like I say, it was kind of it was always fire and ice with us. And um, then we just made each other job easier. Like I didn't have to be a scorer on that team. Like I, like you said, I scored, but that wasn't my job. I didn't have yeah. to. Yeah, exactly. And I was uh, listening to the podcast that you were on uh, recently, talking about, um, like I said, the relationship with Jameer. Can you just tell the listeners here sort of how that started and where that came from, and uh, you know how that impacted your game? Hey, your little buddy. There. My bad. My, yeah, my bad. My dog just came into <laughs> the good. camera. Uh, <laughs> Um, Jameer, that actually, like I said, I knew Jameer already yeah, because of um, because of his little brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, we played AU together, and uh, so I already had like a little small relationship with him, but I never like did any basketball um stuff with him. So that whole relationship ended up developing from G. He had like a he he knew Jameer's agent at the time, and 
after our first season, like G like really invested in me. He's like, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you these workouts. He he, was, he started talking about something. I didn't know what he was talking about at the time. I'm just like, all right, you about to give me a trainer? Like, what do you mean? So he uh he told me like, yeah, you gonna work out with a pro all summer, which was I mean, now I could say now it was probably actually illegal at the time. I probably wasn't supposed to be doing it. <laughs> well, I, I know I wasn't supposed to be doing it at the time, but um, yeah. <laughs> You know, every every program does like stuff like off that. the wall stuff. Yeah, exactly. You go to any program, so uh, I can say it now because we I'm out of school. He's not coaching, but um, <laughs> so I would go down. Uh, he would drop me. I think it started that summer after my freshman year. He he had like one of the assistant coaches dropping me off at the summit, which was um right next to Villanova. Actually, like, yep. right down the street from Villanova. Um, I would I would go there five day uh, Monday through Friday, and I was literally it's literally like a training camp. It's like boot camp for basketball. We literally go there. We do agility stuff. We um do like conditioning stuff. You would lift weights. Then after that, you take like a hour break. Maybe everybody go get something small to eat. Then you go right right down the street to the basketball court. Now you're doing basketball for like an hour. Yeah. This was every this was every day Monday through Friday for the whole entire summer. And you know I'm a I'm basically still a freshman. I'm like what the hell is this? But the whole time I'm not realizing that. He's teaching me how to train like an NBA player, like how to how to put your body intact like an NBA player. And like I learned the, the I didn't I haven't even told Jameer, but I learned so much just from being around him. Cause I, I literally like hung with Jameer every day, pretty much for like up until I'd say like two, three o'clock in the afternoon. I was getting dropped off at six. I probably was it was like a school day. I was getting dropped off at <laughs> like six crazy. in the morning. And like I said, we would work out. We probably wouldn't finish until like one. Then after we get done, everybody's sitting there talking in the gym. I think it was me, Mustafa Jones, who I went to Newman with, um, Garrett Williamson from St. Joe, Steve Smith that went to LaSalle, and Jameer. And like I said, this is just every day, Monday through Friday, for the next three years of my college career, I was doing this. It was like the wow. the best time of my life. I'm talking like you getting top-tier training, you getting top-tier competition, just battling. Like you you're going against an NBA player. Yeah. Going against Garrett Williamson, who's he's a pro now. Steve Smith is a pro. It's like the only people that same age as me and Mustafa Jones. We graduated together, but That's like, awesome. it was unbelievable. Like we, man, like we were training, we were locked in, but we had so much fun. Like just being around a group of guys that all got like the same mode. Like we all just want to play mm-hmm. basketball. We want to like we want to be in the tip top shape when the season comes. It's like it was, it was almost like at the end of the season, like everybody was just like I know I was like we were just so mad. That the uh like the trainer we knew the training was over everybody had to go back to like their regular job. All right. <laughs> you gotta go you gotta go overseas you gotta go back to college you gotta go in the <laughs> NBA. It's like damn yeah. man like all right what was the fun summer until next summer? <laughs> it's like yeah, that's awesome man that's a great that's a great little story there. Think about sort of your uh your overseas career and you know in the last couple of years I really feel like the G League has really cemented itself as like a as like a real league for pathway for guys who might be in your situation. Do you think if it was what it was now when you were sort of coming out of college, you would have maybe been involved in that? Um, so, I mean, I had an opportunity to go to the G League. It's funny because Tim Frazier actually took the job that I turned down. He ended up getting called up. <laughs> so I, I, every time somebody mentioned the G League, that's the first thing that pops into my mind. <laughs> if I would have known what I know what I Shout know now about, like, about overseas and the G League, I probably would have did the G League for like the first two, three years. Just to try it out, because my first my first year out, I'm thinking I'm about to make like a hundred thousand. I took a bad deal, and was making nowhere near that. So I'm like, what I what I signed for, I could have been making in the G League and still been getting NBA exposure. Yeah, so I feel like the, the G I feel like the NBA is it's hard to it's hard to come back to the G League after going overseas for a couple of years. Like I think that's something you got to do right out of college while your name is still fresh and while you know everybody, all the scouts and stuff still know your name. Yeah, Cause like everybody asked me, like, "Yeah, you think about doing the G League, blah blah blah." And it's like, man, I'm, I'm, this my by this time I'm like four or five years in. It's like, nah, there's no yeah. point to do the G League. Like by now I'm making good money. It's, it, I literally have no reason to do the G League other than to shoot for the NBA. And it's like that's not even guaranteed. So uh, I don't know that, but like now, so all that stuff has changed so much. Now you got people that's supposed to be number one recruits in college going to the G League. So it's I don't know, it's all different. I feel like every every like three, four years they change their stuff. So Yeah, isn't I don't it know a, what I would do now. That like G League night or something that has like all the top guys in like 
all the draft picks on, on one team. It's nuts. Yeah, it's like, like, what are you? What is the point? <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I don't know what's up with that. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I was when I was getting doing some research. I, I uh, saw some podcasts. I'm forgot. Forgive me for uh, forgetting the name, but they were talking about your overseas career and like some shady characters you dealt with, and just like <laughs> some pretty funny situations that you sort of detailed in that. So, um, you know, sort of. I guess my question is sort of. Uh, what was what was that first like first year like when you uh you know overseas when you said you maybe didn't get the deal that you thought you were gonna get? Yes, yeah, so I'm think I'm coming out. I'm I'm like I'm uh the final candidate for the uh, Bob Cousy point guard award. I'm thinking like all right, you know what? If I go overseas, not the NBA. I will go overseas. I'm at least make the six figures. Man. My first year overseas, I made twenty grand. And I never got signed. Well, a contract. Yeah. I, was, I, was signed, I signed a contract. I was in tears walking out of the uh, out of the office. My mom even looked at. I showed her the contest. She said, "Like twenty grand, like you signed for. Like what you signed that for?" I was like, "I don't know." My <laughs> agent had it for me. I didn't know what I was doing. So, but yeah, and I and I found, then when I got over there, and I, I, it was like a rude awakening. I'm like, "What the hell is this?" We get over there. It's, it's just the Americans. Like none of the other players are there from. Like none of the local players are there. It's just the Americans for like the first two week, two three weeks, conditioning, yeah. training. So I'm like, all right, like maybe this is how overseas goes. Like. My yes, I'm in Cyprus, so it's like almost a hundred degrees outside. They got us outside like nine, ten o'clock in the morning, running on a on a field, and I'm just like, hey, what kind of like, what is this? I'm like, come on, I'm like, I, my like I said, I, I work with Jameer. We train, <laughs> we train five days a week, every day, all summer. So I'm in tip top shape. I'm like, why the hell am I coming over here? Not doing. I'm barely doing basketball. Like for the first like two three weeks, it was mostly conditioning. And we would go to the gym for like 30 minutes to shoot around and stuff. And I'm like, I'm wasting my time here. And then, uh, like I said, I was, I was barely making any money. Sometimes the money would be late. And like, you just do, like, you, you just, every day it was just something. I'm like, yeah, this can't be what overseas is like. And then you start talking to people and uh, lo and behold, it's like, oh, yeah, like, I dealt with that. And, like, yeah. yeah, it happened to me too. It's like, damn, well, where was all this at when y'all knew, when, we was talking last year before I signed anywhere, and I, did, I wasn't telling me any of this. Like now, as soon as it's happening to me, I'm starting to talk to people. And everybody's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's normal." You know, yeah. payment payments are late, and you gonna argue with your coach, and it's like, come on, man. What's the what's the downtime? What's the downtime like there? Because obviously you're far away from everybody. You doing like video games, or what? Are you, what are you doing? Man, all I do, I, I watch TV and play a video, play the game, man. <laughs> play Call of Duty, 2K, whatever I can do to just try to make the time go by. Yeah. Like it, 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 all, it also depends on where I'm at. Cause like when I'm in Europe, everybody is like six, seven hours ahead of me. Well, I'm six, seven hours ahead of everybody. So by the time I'm like getting ready to call everybody, they're just getting off of work and I'm about to go to bed. So that was that was one of the toughest adjustments I had being overseas um, my first couple of years. Yeah. And this past year, I was in South America. I was only like, I was like an hour ahead of everybody. So I was basically on the same time. So that made it a lot easier. But when you six, seven hours, I know some people just in Japan, they like a whole day ahead. It's, it's pretty tough to do. Like you try to find anything to do just to like keep your mind going and like not think about too much. Yeah, definitely. Is, uh, you know, for you, is coaching sort of in the picture for you in the future or getting back and involved in basketball from uh, when you're done playing? Um, same thing. I just had this conversation with uh, DJ Irvin. Uh, it's my guy in Miami. He asked me the same question. Um, and I, I told him, like, I I, I want to coach, but in order for me to coach, I have to be completely removed from basketball. Like, yeah. I don't want to be, I don't want to be trying to coach. And at the same time, I got like an itch to get out there and play, like, play another five games or like yeah. play another season or whatever. Because he told me, like, man, listen, he's like, I'm a coach, but like, when we do scout report, you like, I suit up with the players and I'm, I'm the point guard on the on the scouting report team. Like I actually get out there and, and play. So he like I get he like I get my little fix in here and there. Uh, where it's like all right, I can I still got it. I can still go. I know I'm in shape. And he's like it's fun for me. And I'm like that's probably what I would have to do. But I'm like right now, like I want to still like play competitively. Yeah. <laughs> like I want to go out there. I want to get the thrill of 